So all around us we see the, the great power of, uh, of technologies that have the potential to transform and already are transforming humanity, the way we think, the way we eat, the way we sleep, the way we do everything. But they can also be deeply, deeply disruptive. So we're here today to talk about the increasing risks that are posed by energy and its associated climate change impact, security, and information technologies, and to think about what we can and really must do uh, to make sure that those powerful technologies are used for the benefit of humanity. So what I'd like to do is start by introducing uh, our panel, uh, and we'll go in order here. Uh, first, Kate Marvel. She's a climate scientist and a writer uh, whose work uh, focuses, in her words, on slaying the climate dragon. She's a theoretical physicist by training. Uh, Dr. Marvel is now a scientist at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies and Columbia University's Department of Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics. As the United States Undersecretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Izumi Nakamitsu is responsible for managing global threats posed by weapons of mass destruction, conventional weapons, and nuclear proliferation. Last year, Fortune magazine named Ms. Nakamitsu to its list of the world's 50 top leaders, citing her clear-headed pragmatism and her quiet activism. Former U.S. Senator Sam Nunn is the founder and co-chair of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. NTI is a nonpartisan and nonprofit uh, organization that works to prevent catastrophic attacks and accidents with weapons of mass destruction and disruption, nuclear, biological, radiological, chemical, and cyber, all of the above. He's also a distinguished professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech and serves as chairman emeritus of the board of the Center for Strategic International Studies in DC. And lastly, Ray Rothrock is a distinguished business leader who has spent more than three decades investing in advising and leading technology and cybersecurity companies. And since 2014, he has served as CEO and chairman of Red Seal, a company that provides critical cyber and business insights to more than 50 government agencies and hundreds of commercial enterprises. He also serves on several boards, including NTI and the Carnegie Institution for Science, uh, and uh, is also a writer. So please join me first in thanking our panel for joining us today. So as, as many of you probably know, our panel this afternoon takes its title from a scriptural passage. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So millennia after those lines were written, uh, we are still grappling with the same fundamental problem, which is how to use powerful but potentially deadly technologies in ways that promote peace and prosperity. So this problem is not new, but stakes have never been as high as they are today. In a world threatened by human-driven climate change, by disruptive digital technologies and nuclear proliferation, our new technologies offer the potential to increase the security, to improve resilience, and to mitigate damage, but only if, only if, if and only if we can prevent bad actors from weaponizing these technologies, and only if we can stop those who already are using these technologies from using them to instill terror and disruption. So as someone who came of age uh, during the Cold War, I have, uh, I have seen reasons for optimism over the years. Nuclear stockpiles in the past 20, 30 years have been dramatically reduced worldwide. Uh, good work is being developed to, uh, to reduce uh, the, the uh, basically to develop low enriched uranium, low enriched uranium fuels in reactors to make them non-proliferation or proliferation proof um, against high enriched uranium. Uh, and new technologies are being used to monitor and to detect proliferation efforts from across the globe. But unfortunately, and this is the dark side, uh, nuclear threat is suddenly looming over us once more. Uh, tensions between the powers have flared dangerously. Lack of communications and, and, and uh, enmity has flared over the last few years. Uh, and just recently, the United States and Russia have scuttled the 19, 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which banned an entire class of destabilizing nuclear capabilities that were in the EU, in Europe. And interestingly, in technology, a new threat posed by the development of hypersonic weapons that some of you may have heard of. These are weapons, or missiles, that are capable of carrying nuclear warheads at five times the speed of sound, meaning they're essentially rendered undetectable. So all this, there's an increased risk of, uh, risk of, of nuclear uh, uh, war, nuclear conflict. 
and nuclear risk overlaps with the dangers of cyber attacks. Digital attacks, which are occurring, as you know, more and more, could be used to trigger a nuclear conflict or could be used to wreak havoc in almost every other sector. An unpre unprecedented scale of pace of expansion in digital technologies has challenged our ability to adapt to it and, and effectively protect our information, our businesses, our infrastructure, even ourselves in your own private world. Uh, and one thing to note, which we'll hear about today, is the private sector is building massive amounts of data sets about, human, about humans and machines. And this is creating a very different balance in the powers that be and rivals what governments know. Without accountability, these, these uh, private industry can actually uh, un destabilize or have a lack of accountability and hence destabilize the, based on the data they collect. So these are all the things that are coming together. So moreover, the risks of weaponized cyber attacks and unfettered private ownership manipulation of personal data have the potential really to upend and hence destabilize our governmental and societal structures. And of course, all of this is happening uh, with the risks of, uh, against the backdrop of the risks of climate change, which is a, an ongoing train that is, that, is, that is very powerful. With global temperatures rising, we really must invent powerful new ways and new technologies to assure humanity's survival. Uh, we must look at the nuclear and digital technologies uh, that are almost certainly going to play a role in these important, uh, importantly reducing our carbon footprint, but at the same time, they'll be important for mitigation at the same time, how do we deal with those technologies? So as we look at these threats, we do not have the option of simply throwing up roadblocks and saying we can no longer worry about these things. We really must uh, pursue solutions to each and every one of these uh, technological challenges. So our challenge is really to find effective means to prevent weaponization of all of the technologies that we're going to be discussing here and to work to harness them for peaceful use. And so with that, what I'd like to do is welcome uh, some of our panelists up to say a few words just to frame the discussion that we will have. And I'd like to start with uh, Senator Nunn. If he'd come up, please, and just say a few words. Thank you very much, Eric, and thanks to Carnegie and all of your different iterations, the cooperation of Vartan, uh, the foundation, the endowment, and the institute, and all of you who are part of that tremendous work you're doing in a very difficult and challenging world. Let me make eight points. I may have a few sub-points in here somewhere, too. Uh, Twelve years ago, George Schultz, Bill Perry, Henry Kissinger, and I wrote in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this was an article where we were uh, setting forth the aspiration of the ultimate uh, goal of getting rid of all of nuclear weapons, reducing reliance on nuclear weapons as a huge step towards eventually getting rid of them. We said with these words, unless new actions are taken, the United States will soon be compelled to enter into a new nuclear era that will be more precarious, psychologically disorienting, disorienting and economically even more costly than was Cold War deterrence, end quote. My message today, very simply, is that we have entered into this new nuclear era, a high-risk era of nuclear instability. Not good news. We all recall, and I was reminded this morning with Jessica Matthews on the uh, panel, we, her, her mother, I believe, Barbara Tuckman, wrote the book called The March of Folly. And this book was a series of blunders that led to catastrophes, including many wars over the centuries. She wrote at least one chapter, as I recall, on the European leaders who led their nation, nations into a war with 40 million casualties. That war was, of course, without the killing power of nuclear weapons. Today, war between nuclear weapon states, not just the United States and Russia, but also other states like India and Pakistan, would greatly exceed that total of casualties in less time than we will spend uh, discussing this issue this afternoon. So that's the magnitude and the stakes involved. Today we face, this is the third point, today we face similar risk of mutual misunderstandings and unintended signals, not just between the United States and Russia, but also, as I mentioned, India and Pakistan, and of course, North Korea and other countries also. Today's technology also allows non-state actors to engage in mass destruction. That is a fundamental change. I believe that nuclear war by blunder 
is more likely than nuclear war by premeditated planning. The fourth point, consider for a moment the what I call gathering storm, including but not limited to the erosion of arms control. The ABM treaty, the Conventional Forces in Europe treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces treaties, those are all gone. They have been terminated. The Open Skies Treaty, you've just recently read about, the New START Treaty, and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty are hanging by a very slender thread. And even the Non-Proliferation Treaty is badly shaken these days. The US and Russia are continuing to have what I consider to be at least an outdated prompt launch nuclear policy. Alongside new threats in cyber and space, Ray will be talking about the cyber side, that could co compromise early warning and command and control systems and increase, greatly increase the chances of false alarm. Hypersonic missiles, which are not only higher speed but also maneuverable, as well as dual use systems, systems that can be used to deliver conventional weapons or nuclear weapons, and <coughs> the country being attacked is not likely to know which until the explosion occurs. So those are the things that are being superimposed on an already dangerous Cold War force posture. The fifth point, my bottom line, the risk of catastrophic blunder are going up, decision time for leaders in determining whether an attack is real and whether and when to retaliate, releasing their own nuclear weapons, that decision time is all important and that decision time is going down. Technology is driving decision time down. Tim mentioned in an earlier panel that it's all about time in another context. Well, in my view, the nuclear challenge today is all about time. If you listed one problem I worry about the most, it would be that one. Finally, point number six, technology including cyber hypersonic weapons uh, today are increasing the risk. Some serious thinkers in what has to be described the doc, Dr. Strangelove mode of thinking, but we're all in the nuclear equation involved in that kind of thinking. You have to be. But some people are so alarmed, and these are serious folks, that uh, by the compressed decision time, uh, and remember that warnings could be false warnings, that they are proposing an automated nuclear response system based on artificial intelligence. In effect, a dead hand coming close to taking humans out of the equation in the final precious minutes. Seventh point, in our new era of instability, it is apparent that technology and science, uh, technology and science are outrunning governmental and international cooperation, outrunning human relations, and outrunning moral considerations. We must reverse this direction and find ways to use technology to reduce risk and give our citizens hope rather than fear. And the final point I would make, there are ways to reduce these risks, uh, and we can talk about those as we go along this afternoon. But at the moment, we're in a race between cooperation and catastrophe and cooperation is in a low gear and running at a very slow speed. So let me just stop right there with that cheery message. And I know that Thank you, Sam. the folks who follow will be optimistic compared to my opening remarks. Well, this is a great way to quick kick off a conversation about climate change, about nuclear and about cyber attacks. So Kate, why don't you tell us a little bit about your thinking in, in, in climate? Sure, yeah, from nuclear devastation to climate devastation. <laughs> um, so I want to start by talking about something that I am very bad at talking about, which is certainty. Scientists hate certainty because we always want to think about the things that we don't understand. That's what we do all day. But when we think about climate change, there are a lot of things that we are as certain about as science can get. So first, we know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. 
and we know that that is the inevitable byproduct of combustion and a lot of the other reactions that we use to generate energy. So we know that we are putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we know that the Earth is warming up. It's risen, the temperature has risen by about a degree Celsius since the Industrial Revolution began. Um, we know what happens on a warming world. We know that it's not just about the average temperature of the planet. We know that warm air holds more water vapor, about 7% per degree warming. So that means when it does rain, it pours. There is more rainfall that can be dumped on cities like Houston during Hurricane Harvey. We also know that as rainfall increases, these heavy rainfall events, evaporative demand also increases. So paradoxically, we're looking at, in a warmer world, more flooding, but also more droughts. We know that as sea surface temperatures heat up, that's hurricane food. We expect that hurricanes will get stronger. And we know that as sea levels rise, that storm surge can go further inland. So we know a lot about climate change. But there's also a lot of stuff that we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty in the system. There's the uncertainty that comes from considering any chaotic system, uncertainty associated with weather. And that's why I can't tell you, you need to sell your Miami condo at precisely 9.30 a.m. <laughs> uh, January 26, 2025. I cannot give you that precision. There's also uncertainty in the system which I work on, which is physical uncertainty. We don't know exactly what feedback processes are gonna be triggered on a warming planet because this has never really happened before. We're experiencing conditions that are arguably completely unprecedented in the entire history of the planet. But I think the number one uncertainty is what human beings are gonna do. When I think about climate policy, I think about it as allocating to various degrees mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And our actions today will determine how those get meted out and to what populations. And something that's really hard for me to come to terms with as a physicist who thinks about molecules and parcels of air moving around in a physical system. Something that's been really hard for me to come to terms with, but I do think is really deep and profound, is that climate change happens in the world that we build for it. I can set off climate change over and over and over again in the climate models that I run in my job. But climate change, we experience it here. And that means that climate change is happening to the societies that we've built. And I think we really need to keep that in mind as we think about the threats that it poses. Thank you. So, uh, Vartan, I promise you we're going to get to the positive in a minute. <laughs> but first, I'm going to ask Ray to say a few words about the cyber threat. Thank you, Eric. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here and uh, to the Carnegie Corporation for this opportunity. So as, as Eric described, I was a venture capitalist for the last 25 years. Um, just a little background there. To, to be a good venture capitalist, you need pretty good pattern recognition. And pattern recognition comes from seeing lots of patterns, not unlike what AI does. We just did it in our brains. But the job was to identify entrepreneurs who had identified an interesting problem. And then, then to apply precious capital, in my case, the Rockefeller family capital, to these problems and work on them for maybe a decade or two. I'm involved actually in a project right now. I'm 15 years into it. It's working, but we're not quite finished. But that's what venture capital is. And at the end of the day, it, uh, it allows us to have many shots on goal. There is no one silver bullet for any of these problems we're gonna talk about. It, you, we, need, we need armies of intelligent, armies of committed people working on all these problems. So I'm a big fan of that. And my, my uh, many shots on goal, I did 53 deals. I had eight initial public offerings, and I mostly focused on cybersecurity. And why? Because as an adult, I sort of came of age when uh, the ARPANET was happening. I worked for Sun Microsystems, and then the internet happened, and it was just an obvious thing to do. And here we are now, 40 years later, into this thing we call the digital revolution. So I subscribe to the fact that this is going to turn our world upside down. Why do I say that? Well, I read a lot of smart, a lot of books by a lot of smart people, but, but mostly if you just think about it, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we competed with animals for food, grazers, nomads. Then we figured out how to grow more food than we could consume, and we became agrarians. That was about 10,000 years ago. 
And then a couple hundred years ago, we figured out steam. 200 years ago, in fact, I think it's about 200 years ago now. Uh, steam, and we had power, so we had an industrial revolution. Well, now we're in a digital revolution, and each one of those revolutions completely disorganized how people organize themselves. Cities, states, countries, economies, invention, you name it. We, we completely turned our world upside down, and I would say we're in the middle of that right now. So, what does one do with that situation? Well, I think we have to look to what has worked in the past and applied in the cyber world. Remember, the cyber world is not a place you can see. It's a place we all visit. I don't know how many computers are in this room right now and how many of us are connected to the internet, but we're, we're living it right now, though we can't see it and touch it. But we live in a physical world, which we figured out how to operate pretty well, save the nuclear issues that we're dealing with today. But we said, wait, well, let me give you a, a crystal clear example. Take this room, big room, I don't know, 300 seats, 500 seats, all these lights, electric power. There's a sprinkler system up there. Why is there a sprinkler system up there? Did any of you go by the office and check the certificate of compliance to see that that fire system would work if we had a fire in here? There's a sprinkler system in here just in case there is a fire. We don't expect a fire. You wouldn't be sitting here if you thought there would be a fire today. There's also a government that took care of inspection during building. They inspect this building regularly and we know the building is safe, and we trust that we have a system of laws, regulations, compliance, verification, which creates trust. And that's what's lacking in a big way in the cyber world in which we live. So I'm a big fan of borrowing from the past what's worked, applying it to the cyber world, and as Eric mentioned, I wrote a book last year called Digital Resilience, where we can go from a world where we think we can put up a a gate and be perfectly safe, That's, we, we can't lock every door, and we know that bad people break down doors, but we can build a world like this room which is resilient to the threats that we can understand and see. And so I'm a, a, a big fan of that, and, and uh, one of the questions Eric asked me, I'm just gonna touch on it here, so what, what's like you know, dangerous technology? Well, presently, I think it's social engineering. I, I really, I worry that it has created uh, we used to call them birds of a feather, an ability to hang out with people of like minds and forget the facts and just sort of believe what you say. And we're right now in this, this amazing disruptive political system where that is what is exactly happening. And that's social engineering. And it's, it's also, it can be flipped on its head and we will have to do that. And maybe, I don't know that busting up the big tech guys back west will do it, but we certainly have to think about it. So I think it's, it's four things. It's government, leadership, political leadership. It's academia and the inventors that come up with cool technologies to solve these problems, things like firewalls on the internet. It's industry that can build and deploy and operate. This building was built not by academics and not by government, but by an industry. And then there's the public who has to want it, and that's education. And so I'm, those four things all come together, and, and just as the world turned itself upside down at each of those human events, we're in one right now. And I don't know if it's going to take five years or 50 years, but, but we have to work on it, and we have to solve those problems. Thanks. Izumi, please, give <laughs> us your, you. your, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm yeah. not sure if I could paint a rosy picture from the United Nations perspectives, but let me start with the, uh, three points before I get into the possible impacts of those science and technologies on hardcore peace and security issues. The first is um, start with a little bit of a positive. I think we need to remember that innovations uh, for the most part and historically um, have been beneficial to humankind and so we need to remember that. Uh, but at the same time, let's not be alarmist, um, and then let's not be dismissive either. So we need to take a balanced approach to this whole issue. The second is that many of those things are still to be really better understood. Uh, we need to uh, form a better understanding of what might be the impacts um, in order for us to be able to keep pace with the developments of science and technologies. And then the important thing for me um, for us to be able to really have that better understanding, we need to have uh, interdisciplinary approaches. Science community, technology community, and the policy communities really have to work together. 
Um, so no traditional sort of governments uh, go to the UN and, and discuss and uh, tech, tech industries and scientists and academics, you know, talk among, amongst themselves. I don't think that's going to work. The third um, is that um, many of those technologies uh, have individual impact, um, disruptive impacts, but what the real dark story might be, the combination of the conversions of those different technologies. Um, Senator Nam already talked about you know, what might be the impact on nuclear command control, uh, but what might be the combined impact of AI and, and cyber and hypersonics and that also impacting nuclear command and control systems. So we need to really better form uh, um, understandings on, on the combined uh, uh, perspectives of those different kinds of technologies. Now, having said that, what might be possible impacts? Um, in the UN, um, we can already uh, start talking about very concrete possible scenarios, possible impacts. I can just put uh, six or seven um, concrete examples of, of those uh, practical impacts. One, opening um, of uh, new domains for conduct of hostilities, cyber domains, cyber warfare commonly now referred to, outer space, another domain for p potential conduct of war. Um, second, um, I think uh, many people are now starting to really talk about it, undermining protections of civilians. Uh, in those uh, new type of warfare, be simply because the, the, there is a, a evolving nature of uh, um, conflict, uh, warfare, etc. Uh, so we need to think about protection of civilians' dimensions in, in conflict. Three, um, this has been already mentioned, uh, but lowering the threshold on the use of armed force, mm -hmm. the risk um, um, escalation. Um, the decision time uh, has been much reduced. Um, so you might actually have, the, or the commanders might have a mentality of use it or lose it type of uh, uh, thinking. V really dangerous uh, potential impact. Um, it could also trigger destabilizing state behavior. For example, major arms race could start. Some people say that it's already starting. Uh, deployment to weapon systems with really unpredictable outcomes, uh, uh, results. That's another risk of uh, uh, destabilizing behavior. Um, fifth, opening new vulnerabilities such as hacking and spoofing uh, of command and control facilities. Uh, again, that will have a major impact on escalation, uh, possible escalation uh, of scenarios. Sixth, undermining strategic stability. Uh, and increasing prospects of a use of nuclear weapons. Uh, again, this is a doomsday scenario that we talk about uh, in the UN when we look at arms control uh, uh, systems. And then, um, above all, unintended, unpredictable consequences. Many of those things we are still unknown and it's continuing to evolve. So uh, there are a lot of unintended, unpredictable consequences uh, attached to it. So if I could actually summarize those potential impacts, I think two things, both short term and, and long term. In the immediate term, these potential impacts, you can imagine, uh, will be uh, really dangerous even in the, the most benign international environment. But those things are now happening against the background of a deteriorating international security environment, lack of trust, um, lack of dialogues, um, uh, eroding also rules-based international order that we often talk about in the UN context. So it's already very dangerous in the most secure environment, but this is happening against the background of a really dangerous environment. So that's uh, something that we need to really tackle immediately. And in the second, a little bit longer term, uh, which is that um, you know, all these technologies actually have a potential to change how wars are fought, uh, which means that there are concerns that some of those new weapon systems could challenge existing norms about conduct of war, uh, including international humanitarian law. Um, so there are also questions as to whether uh, there are gaps in the norms that we have at the moment. So what do we do about this? Uh, uh, what are the, uh, some of the important things that we need to keep in mind uh, when, when we are about to or when we are already starting to tackle some of those challenges? Let me just summarize four. The first is that, um, um, believe it or not, uh, there are already 
um, important multinational discussions that are um, ongoing in, in many of those areas. Um, I could go into details during the conversations perhaps, but there are two intergovernmental discussions taking place on cybersecurity issues. Um, interesting uh, meetings have been going on with a degree of success on what, what we call lethal autonomous weapon systems. This is the AI-enabled weapon, weapon systems um, with a success of uh, agreeing by consensus, consensus on 10 uh, principles going forward with these kinds of uh, uh, weapon systems. Um, interesting expert level governmental meetings taking place uh, with really in-depth discussions on outer prevention of uh, arms race in outer space. Uh, in the context of biological weapons conventions, uh, there are a lot of things that are being discussed on the, the impact of those new uh, biotechnology. So um, there are interesting in-depth discussions going on. I think we need to now analyze, as I mentioned before, what might be the linkages uh, between those areas and combined impact on international security. Traditional concepts like deterrence and, and strategic stability really should be reevaluated in the digital uh, um, uh, age. Um, so um, I think this will probably amount to probably there is a need for new vision or new approaches to arms control. A second, norm making, norm implementation uh, has to go beyond in 21st century, uh, beyond the traditional intergovernmental negotiations and that really have to involve industry, scientists, uh, um, uh, private sector, academia, civil society, um, uh, and uh, I think, again, um, the importance is for us to be able to create effective what we call multi-stakeholder platforms for these uh, actors to come and discuss what we really need to develop. Um, so it will um, require a mix of dialogue, uh, education, uh, a really a, a thinking process involving variety of actors. Um, a third already mentioned, I think protection of civilians should be really uh, one of our guiding principles going forward. Um, and again, um, we need to really uh, identify whether there are gaps in the, the existing norms and, and, and instruments that we have. And fourth, which is uh, uh, my concluding word, a little bit positive, uh, which is that I think we should devote much more time in thinking through how we can utilize those science and technologies for um, uh, purposes that, that will enhance peace and security. I was at the NATO headquarters a couple of months ago uh, where the uh, military experts actually were telling me how it is much more difficult today to hide things thanks to uh, those new technologies, new, new uh, means of uh, verification. So we should invest much more time to, to utilize those uh, new science and technologies for peaceful purposes as well. Thank you. So. Um so let me start with a question that I think applies to everybody here, which is, um, you know, it, whether it's, it's, it's climate, which is a global problem, all these problems are global. And uh, what, we're, what we're also hearing is that there's a breakdown in a lot of the traditional, actually formal treaties, but also in conversations between the US and Russia, between many of the smaller states and other states. The UN is, remains a, a, a prominent figure, but maybe not with the same kind of clout it had in the past. So the question is, and this is a thread running through the whole day, is where is the leadership going to come from? So who, where, you know, what, what are the, you know, historically a lot of these treaties have been signed because we've had leadership. We've had, even if it were bilateral leadership, we had leadership in countries like Russia, the US, China, others, where there was a commitment to not killing off millions of people. There was a commitment to avoiding war and, and, and heading toward peace. So I would love to hear from from the panel where they think this kind of leadership can come, same thing in cyber, but where maybe Sam and Izumi could talk a little bit about how they think about the leadership aspect in this. Well, taking up on the last point that Izumi made about getting the, the best minds we have in not just the United States, but in the world to you look, look at technology and say, what are the opportunities for building peace with, with technology? And in the nuclear arena, that means reducing risk. And in my mind, it means increasing decision time and warning time. Because when you compress warning time, you make the chances of an accident much, much more likely. And as I mentioned, blunder to me is much more likely than a deliberate premeditated attack or catastrophic terrorism where third state, non-state actors uh, get nuclear materials 
which is, by the way, on the optimistic side, one place where we've made real progress in the last 20 years. But if I put the top of the list of things that, that need to be done is sustained dialogue between the nuclear powers. And that starts with the United States and Russia, but there are a number of other nuclear powers, including China, India, and Pakistan. But we have to have bilaterals with, the, with Russia. Uh, we, in the last uh, several years, uh, last 10 years, have treated uh, dialogue uh, with the Russians in particular as if it's a reward for good behavior. Uh, dialogue with the two countries that have 90% of the nuclear weapons and 90% of the nuclear materials is not a reward for good behavior. In fact, the more strained the relations, the more we need the dialogue. And so to me, that's a fundamental mistake that we have made. When Russia invaded uh, Georgia, uh, NATO decided they would punish them by not having uh, the NATO-Russian Council meet. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Ukraine uh, Crimea, uh, we did the same thing. We said, we're not going to talk to you guys. We don't like what you've done. Well, to me, that's a fundamental error, particularly when you view the stakes. So sustained dialogue is enormously important uh, with Russia, but also with China. Uh, I would also say you need to greatly broaden the agenda for the dialogue. It can't just be arms control per se. It's got to involve the fear list of both sides. And I would include in that, on that fear list prompt launch with con conventional weapons, uh, long-range conventional weapons. I would include cyber. As Ray said, there are no rules and regulations now. I mean, the cowboys and their horses are both in the saloons shooting up the joint, and there's dynamite in the attic. And that's where we are in the cyber world. And if the United States and Russia start tinkering around with each other's command and control and warning systems, uh, watch out. Or if third-party actors find ways to get into warning systems, including those in India and Pakistan, uh, watch out for a catastrophic okay. blunder. So cyber, we've got to talk about space, we've got to talk about prompt strike, we've got to talk about dual use where we have weapons that could be either conventional or nuclear, and if you're being attacked, you wouldn't know which was which until the explosion occurs. So you're going to react accordingly. Um, and I think we have to, it's been a sacred cow, but I think we have to put on the table the, def the defense and the offense relationship between defensive weapons and offensive weapons in terms of uh, ABM treaty. We, uh, we eliminated the ABM treaty. Uh, Henry Kissinger spent uh, years trying to convince the Russians that if you have defensive systems and they're successful enough, effective enough, so that you could have a first strike and then catch what's left with the defensive systems that's very destabilizing. That's where the ABM treaty came from. Guess what? That psychology still exists. Guess what? The Russians finally bought into it. We had the ABM treaty, and then we changed our minds. We decided that we, we did not want the ABM treaty, and a lot of the de weapons you hear about Russia's developing, but developing now, which is absolutely true, they've got five or six new weapon systems, the origin of that is their fear of American defenses. So they overlearned the lessons we taught them, and then we changed our mind. So we've got to put offense and defense on the table. Those are just a few of the things that we're going to have yeah. to do. So, but let me push a little harder. So, so a, a good defense and a good offense is technology. So we want science and technology to progress and, and develop better ways of detecting, better, better ways of weaponizing, et cetera. So we have a little go back to mutually destruction. But right now, as you pointed out in your discussion, and, and but both of you pointed out, there, there's a lack of leadership. I mean, but we're pulling away from these treaties. We're pulling away from the things that have, the multi-layers that have kept us secure, at least in terms of some level of protection. Who is it in the future who's going to actually provide that leadership? Or do we just wait until the leadership shows up? Is there a, is there a, are, are there people that we don't know? Or are there countries that actually could step into the, what's now looks like a void? to start thinking about exactly what you're talking I agree with everything you're saying, and I think the audience would agree, but where is the leadership going to come for this? And I think that's going to be a real challenge for us, because right now we're stepping away from everything that I think you've just said. So what is the, the answer to that, or don't we have one? Well, from the UN's perspective, we are obviously, you know, repeatedly calling for the leadership to come also 
uh, from the, the two largest uh, holders of uh, nuclear arsenals, more than 90%, as you said. Yeah. Um, it, has, it was not really a, a practice that um, you know, we appealed to, you know, singling out to countries and, and appealed to ex please extend uh, a treaty, yeah. New START treaty. Um, yeah. Uh, because these are bilateral arrangements, uh, but the, the, the current you know, security environment is such that we feel now compelled to actually call for <laughs> leadership to come from the two, and, and that is the responsibility of the two uh, nuclear uh, weapon superpowers, I would say. Uh, but this said, um, you know, this is also a responsibility of everyone. Um, you know, just a, a part of a history at the multilateral level, the famous NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, that was born out of a, a small, one small country, uh, Ireland, uh, taking an initiative, um, you know, the famous Irish resolution at the United Nations General Assembly uh, that actually grew into this uh, 50 year, now 50-year-old treaty, which is a pillar of international security. So. You know, small countries with a vision and a diplomatic skills to bring together different kinds of countries actually can exercise leadership so, over you, this. So can you give us examples of countries that you think are moving in the right direction? Well, I mean, there are a group of countries that are, you know, working together to appeal to those, uh, um, you the know. The bigger countries. Military yeah. powers. And then from the UN's perspectives, yeah. we think it is also our responsibility to, to you know, provide a platform for them to engage meaningfully, uh, effectively. Uh, we still do have a um, sort of legitimacy, uh, a convening power, etc. cetera. Yeah. Uh, so we definitely need to exercise that responsibility to, to you know, bring together different actors. But I would say uh, responsibility of uh, uh, nuclear superpowers will be definitely there. Yeah. And, and, and we are uh, making sure that the, the voices will be heard. Eric, if I had one thing that I could get to two leaders, President Putin and President Trump, to do at a, some summit, it would be to recognize the compressed decision time and to call in their military commanders and say, folks, we're not technicians. We want you and the scientific community to find ways to give both of us more decision time. Let's just assume hypothetical. I'm sure it's classified. I haven't been briefed lately on it, but let's just assume it's seven, eight, ten minutes for the purpose of argument. Um, I would say to the military leaders, find ways to give us 20 minutes. And then once we get 20 minutes, find ways to give us 40 minutes. And then give us an hour. And then give us two hours and then give us ten hours. If you I'd rather have that kind of agreement than a reduction in arms agreement. I'd like both, but that to me is more important because if nuclear weapons remain as relevant as they are today in the force posture, nobody's going to get rid of them. Yeah. You know, I reduce some, but you're not going to get rid of them. You've got to make them less relevant if you're going to then really deal with them. So that kind of mandate to military leaders and scientific leaders uh, is all important, I think. Yeah. Let me, let's turn to cyber for a minute. Okay. And, and um, you know, of course, in the last, even in the last few years, we've seen cyber, not just attacks, but the use of cyber in turning elections, not going to mention any names. We've seen Facebook being accused of being at fault. We've seen Google being accused of being at fault. Um, and, you know, and you've already said it, I mentioned it before, that the data they have, give, the data and the access they give is a great levelizer, but it's also a real threat. So who's responsible in that case, from a leadership point of view or from a corporate point of view, who's responsible for, for managing that kind of uh, infiltration into potentially destabilizing uh, access to, say, an electorate or, a, or, a, you know, or, or the, basically social engineering is what you called it, right? Yeah. Who's responsible for, for moderating, managing, and setting the regulations for that? Well, we have laws, election laws, and and uh, how money is to be taken in and how money is to be spent. So we actually have a lot of systems already in place that dealt with uh, the, uh, uh, the physical part of elections. But what we don't have is a lot about the data, as you suggest. And privacy is a really big deal. I, you know, I do live in California, so I've got a little bit of a libertarian uh, feelings there about, you know, don't bother me, I'm fine. But at the end of the day, uh, the ability to use software to manipulate someone's opinion 
and that being manipulated by foreign powers spending hundreds of millions of dollars in our system selling an ad, uh, for example, and drawing you into this conclusion, I think is wrong. Uh, in that four, four elements of government, academia, industry, and the public, I think the government has a responsibility there. But look, uh, you know, the, the corporation does too. They have to understand the laws, they have to obey the laws, they have to uh, demonstrate that they've done that. I, that's the old trust but verify uh, thesis that I grew up with uh, in the nuclear age, trust but verify. We can do the same thing with these sorts of things. So uh, it is a technology issue. Uh, AI for behavioral uh, uh, management or behavioral ob observation, I think, is perfectly good. We use expert witnesses in the court of law when we're comparing things. Why can't we use AI to say this person's behavior is way out of the line of his life's analysis? We're going to have that data if it doesn't already exist. In fact, I just read this weekend in the New York Times, there's some facial recognition database that you know, has been used for all this technology. So. Uh, it's called mass data or something like that, that all the, all the AI systems are using it to learn with. So uh, if we can do that, we can create the regulations, and then we have to have a population that will abide by those regulations. And I think that's just like we walk into this building, we trust, we have to that. Right now, we don't trust the social network world very well. I don't trust it very well. And I think it's early, early days. So one, one of the things, I, I, an idea, this is a very unpopular idea in my world. You know, I've, I've read, and I think it's right, whoever gets you know, quantum computing and gets the AI really working first is going to win. It's the going to win part that bothers me. It's like the nuclear weapons back in the 40s, we worked in secret, but people were giving the Russians the secrets, and so suddenly everybody had nuclear weapons. So why don't we just, we know they're going to get it. Let's just all do it together and move the frontier forward and agree on how we will engage the world. Climate change actually ties us all together. Yeah. We have one planet. We're all doing this together. So it seems to me that if somehow the leadership of the major economies, China and the U.S., could align their interests, if AI quantum is going to be one of the things that defines the future of the world, then we ought to be able to do that. I, I'm reminded in, in uh, Bob Gates' book, Duty, He's uh, being grilled by the Senate. Uh, he's a Secretary of Defense designate. And uh, maybe you were there. I don't know. Um, Senator said, do you trust the Russians uh, to uh, Dr. Gates? And Dr. Gates said, I do not trust the Russians. I do not trust you either, Senator. <laughs> and everyone laughed like that. He says, why don't you trust me? He says, because our interests are not aligned. So if you took this technology and thought about what interest we can line up with the various leaderships of, you know, the aggressive Russian behavior, the Chinese economic, the China's going to be equal to the U.S. It's just, look, the magic of compounding, Einstein had it right. That's the most powerful equation in the world. They're going to be as big as we are 12 years, 15 years. I can do the arithmetic as well as anybody. So we might as well get used to it, we might as well bring it to the table, and we might as well move this frontier together. That's what I think, and that's a very unpopular comment. I, mean, I on guess the, West the Coast. question I'd ask just to push on that is, you know, you, you mentioned quantum, right? Yeah. And, and the, the, one of the great promises of quantum is encryption or decryption. But just as soon as we... And so how could you have a common interest if oh, you're talking about no, encryption? No, you, you, it's simple. RSA works on normal computers now, and, we'll, and as soon as quantum figures out how to crack that, yeah. we'll come up with quantum encryption. Yeah. And then we're right back to where we are today. Yeah. It's, it, well, smart guys will come up with the algorithms. I'm not worried about that. I, quantum will crack what we have now just as the Internet connects us to things we didn't know about. Yeah. That's, yeah. Were you, you had a comment? No, I defer to Ray on the cyber side. I'm just, I, <laughs> I, I, I like the way he thinks about it, though. I mean, it, it, it makes all sorts of sense. I think it's the most powerful tool we could possibly have. Yeah for the benefit of mankind, but it's like some other technologies and the biological is another example. Yeah, it's another it's one, also yes. got a dark side. And what we haven't recognized is the, the dark side and we haven't recognized that the world, not just the United States, has a stake in cooperation and working on the dark side. I mean, the most optimistic thought I have in terms of the dark, gloomy uh, equation I laid out on the nuclear is the fact that the Russians have the same problem. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's not like we have diametrically opposed interests. It's not like interest. communism versus capitalism. Right. This yeah. is existential. This is survival. Yeah. And my Russian friends understand that perfectly well. I mean, these, these, right. are, these people are smart people. We may disagree with them, and we do occasionally, and we do frequently. And we certainly 
you know, abhor some of the conduct they've had. It's hard to, to say, okay, well, we read in the paper yesterday they were bombing hospitals, and now we're going to talk to them. But we've got to. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't condemn them for things they do, uh, but we do it in a way that understands we have the interest of survival together. And to me, uh, we're not there yet with the Chinese on the nuclear side, but we will be. And we certainly are probably already there, as Ray points out, on the AI side. So I think this, this business of understanding that we have common survival interest and that technology is going to make it more complex yeah. is absolutely essential. You know, even the, I don't in any way diminish the interference in the U.S. election. I think it was a blunder on the part of the Russians. I believe the intelligence community is correct. I think they yes. did interfere. Uh, I think it was a very bad mistake, totally counterproductive. But we shouldn't be shocked. <laughs> no. I mean, we spent 40 years with the Soviet Union, and they basically did everything they could with disinformation every single day. Uh, so we shouldn't be shocked. We've got to take steps to protect ourselves. No. The problem is we haven't developed a deterrence in the cyber well, world. We're, but presumably we're doing the same thing. So it's, it's sort of, you know, the U.S. is doing the same thing. But what, you know, it sort of raises this question that you're both, kind of, all, all of you are sort of hedging around, which is the dual use technology, right? So there's tremendous benefits to nuclear. I mean, if we're talking about carbon, unfortunately, Kate had to step yeah. out for a minute. But if we're talking about carbon reduction in this country alone, 20% of our electricity is, is nuclear. And, Ray sits on a, on a company, you think about it, you think about nuclear. I mean, how do we, want, how do we think as a, as a society about all of the things we're talking about there have great dual use, and in particular, nuclear, right? So if we're heading toward a, a carbon-free future, how does it not involve nuclear? So how do, how do you at NTI think about, um, about that, that, not necessarily a conflict in interest, but certainly uh, how do you think about protecting, safeguarding, um, and, and related to technology, are there better technologies for safeguarding? And it, for countries that are developing, such as China, but at the same time, make sure that you're protecting against uh, nuclear potential nuclear threats. Well, it's real easy to, uh, you know, in a uh, developing country, to go out and scrape the earth and get some coal and burn it or whatever, or hay or whatever, or dung, whatever they use. That we're not going to stop that. But what we can do is we. It, and it, by the way, I think energy is all about economics, so it's got to be cheap. It's got to be safe. Those are all safety is a compliance government thing, yeah. um, but it's got to be economically viable and it's got to be transportable. And so a lot of the investments, not a lot, some of the investments I did in my day were related to exactly those things, because it, it, electricity, for example, is the elixir of life. It is what made modern society modern, and we got to make it cheap. And believe me, I live in California where it is not cheap, and occasionally they do turn out the lights. Yeah. Uh, for an extended period of time. So uh, I appreciate what, what electricity can be. So anyway, I, I think that nuclear, I'm involved with the Department of Energy on their uh, Nuclear Energy Advisory Board, and there are 77 nuclear startups in the country. 77, Eric. That, that's, that's a phenomenon. I bet nobody, nobody would have ever guessed that number. And every one of those guys, those, those CEOs, know that proliferation is a bad thing. They don't like the idea that their technology could be used for weapons or anything else. So they are designing these machines to be proliferation resistant or proliferation proof. There, there are alternative fuels, or there's all kinds of things. We've, at least that generation of designers have learned from the last 50 years that this is a bad idea to have these open fuel cycles and stuff. So I'm actually a big believer in it. And I'll finish by saying, we need all the energy we can come up with, whether it's great solar, uh, water, moving bricks up and down, batteries, I don't know, whatever, we need it all because we have a developing world and the amount of power is gonna go up by 50% in the next 20, 30 years, and we cannot do it burning anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm all for innovation, low cost, and get it out there. Yeah. Yeah, I think in terms, I'm not an expert on climate change, although I'm, I'm a believer. I think it really, we have a real, a real challenge. I think that, um, that we're going to have to do, Ernie Moniz is my partner. He's the CEO of NTI now. And Ernie was the Deputy Secretary of Energy at one point, and then he was Secretary of Energy, and then he ran the physics department at MIT, and then he ran the MIT uh, Energy Initiative where he crossed all the silos at MIT and looked at it. So. I read what he says. That's my degree of expertise. Uh, and so er Ernie believes we have to, as Ray just said, we have to have all of the above. Some countries are going to burn coal. 
uh, we, we are cutting it out in this country. I'm thankful for that. Uh, and other countries too, but that's not the, that's not the poor countries. It's got to be economic. We've got to help them develop clean coal as much as possible. Maybe it's impossible, but certainly it can be less carbon intensive than it is now. We're going to have to have solar. We're going to have to have wind. I think we're going to have to have a major research effort in terms of uh, f finding uh, ways that we can reduce carbon that's already up there yeah. in the atmosphere. Um, Ernie hard. says that we can't get there by 2050 by simply alternative energies, even with the nuclear uh, uh, developments and modular and other ways, yeah. what was, if we don't find something that we can do with what's already up there. Now that doesn't mean necessarily uh, it's got to be pure technology approach, but technology's got to be part of it. It's got to be a huge R&D program, he believes. And we also, uh, for instance, need to plant a massive number of trees and we need to find ways that soil uh, can uh, absorb more carbon. Crops, farming communities are going to play, play a big role in this. Yeah. And agriculture needs alternatives also. So, you know, I think it's kind of be an all of the above approach, including energy efficiency. I think uh, massive amounts of energy can be saved in efficiency. But we're not, to Ray's point, we're not going to tell poor countries, you can't have electricity now. We've done it for, you know, 100 years. You don't get a turn. It's not going to work because the energy is the equivalent of, of the standard of living. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have it, mm -hmm. your standard of living is... Yeah, so, so maybe that's a good question yeah. uh, to, t to talk about and even talk about in the context of the UN, this idea of third world countries. And their, you know, if you look at the amount of carbon we're putting up into the atmosphere now, it's about... 35 gigatons on 700, so just so you know, it's about 5% of what's naturally occurring we're putting up by man, human-made uh, carbon. Uh, and it, we're, it, despite all the efforts that we're making globally, that number keeps rising very fast, and, and as well as methane. So methane, even yeah. with regulation, mm -hmm. it's just not happening. But to your point, Sam, it's, it's, you could say it's unfair for us to say, well, now the states will, will ask everybody else to cut as we cut carbon, which we're not doing, by the way, but you could say that. Yeah. What is, you know, how do you think about this from an international, from a, exactly this developing country point of view? It's, it comes back to affordability. And, and even today, we don't have affordability with, with solar and wind. It's getting cheaper, but it's not at a position yet where it's still cheaper than building coal plants. China still builds coal plant every few days, right? So. So they are growing rapidly, and they're growing rapidly at a rate economically plus the energy that supplies that economic growth at a rate which is consistent with what they want to do, but they're doing it with carbon, a lot of carbon. So the question is, how do you play, is there a fair way to, to have uh, major nations start cutting back and at the same time you know, have these third world economies think about how they can pull back on carbon or, or not? Is there a fair way to have this happen on a global scale? Have, have, is this presumably something the UN thinks about? Well, I mean, to me, uh, the question should not be, is there a fair way or yeah. not? Yeah. Uh, to us, I think, I mean, as the Secretary General said, it's no longer global warming, but it's, it's climate, climate crisis or emergency. Yeah. So the question is not really uh, whether there is a, a way. I think we need to find a way to do it. Um, so, you know, that was the whole, you know, purpose uh, behind organizing this uh, climate Action Summit. Right. It was not Climate Summit, it was Climate Action Summit. That each country who will come to this summit will actually bring some sort of a new measures beyond what have already committed. Um, right. So that was, you know, I, I think we need to, 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 to find uh, different kinds of uh, questions that we... Right, we I, but I still, to, uh, so my opinion on this is that this is a scaling problem, that, uh, mm -hmm. that the science is almost there. I think we have yes. the technologies, we have, too bad Kate's not here, but we don't have the sequestering technology yet, but we certainly have the technologies, nuclear, solar, wind. We, we know how to... We know how to make biofuels. We know how to drop in, you know, hydrogen. We know how to make hydrogen. It's just very expensive and, 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 and difficult. So we have the science, and I have no doubt that by 2050, the science is easily going to provide. It's really a scaling question. It's really a question about how Ray is going to start a company that, that provides, you know, gigawatts of power to the world through fusion. But the question then is, I mean, how did, what role does UN play in that? Because it is, it's, it's a, you, you talk about interdisciplinary. This is business, science, mm -hmm. and countries working together in some way. And I, you know, I go to many conferences on climate and on energy, and you know, there's always, it always ends up being, okay, we're, we all work on it, but what is the, 
what is the, it gets back to leadership, what is the principle here that will get people to start really charging or pulling in the same direction uh, and be collaborative in the way that you, you intimated in your introductory remarks? Well, I agree with you that, um, you know, the key is how we can actually mainstream these kinds of thinkings in businesses, financial sectors, how we invest in green economy, uh, you know. Uh, and then what I see now is that there is a beginning of business, uh, private sector entities that are really starting to, to realize that, well, this is actually good business. There is a future. Um, you know, one of the things that we felt actually encouraged about um, this country, the United States, is that even though the government decided to pull out from the Paris Accord, there were a lot of private sector entities uh, and local governments that were actually, you know, that came out and, and announced that they will abide by their commitments. Yeah. Um, so as I think, well as the mayors. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and so I think the key is to mainstream that it is a good thinking for business. And the same thing, actually, you know, if I could put this, uh, our discussions a little bit back to the cyber areas, I am also beginning to see in cybersecurity issues so many private sector entities taking leadership and initiatives to come up with their voluntary uh, industry standards and, and, and uh, norms of. Uh, good behavior, code of conduct. Um, so I think this is why I say, you know, I, I come from the UN, which is a, a traditional intergovernmental international organization. We're not particularly good at working with, traditionally, uh, working with civil society and private sectors, but something is really changing. For me, the UN General Assembly High Level Week was really about cybersecurity yeah. and really a series of high level meetings with private sector people. Um, so I think that's where the future is, and that's where we could see a beginning of a serious leadership also coming. I think that's particularly important in the biological area too. With the new technologies in, in the biological area, we're going to have to have governmental involvement, but it's going to have to be an awful lot of cooperation with the private sector, and they're going to have to have best practices and standards, and the scientists are going to have to monitor each other. I don't mean spy on each other, but they're going to have to have ethical standards in laboratories because in the nuclear area with all the problems you at least we've got verification technologies enable verification in a lot of the nuclear dimensions which is enable arms control so from that point of view technology has really worked in our favor it's going to be a lot more difficult in the biological area because you can do you know experiments with dangerous pathogens in a 12 by 12 foot basement yeah. Uh, and so the verification part of it's going to have to be an awful lot of, I don't want to use the word crowdsourcing because I don't know a whole lot about it, but <laughs> it's going to have to be scientists sourcing each other and monitoring each other, particularly with the CRISPR technology and the other things that are coming along very rapidly. Well, but I think this comes back also to the cyber issue, one second, Ray, yes. which is that, you know, scientists generally, I'm a scientist, I will claim I'm a card-carrying physicist, but scientists do have a peer review system where things like CRISPR get out, you know, Jennifer right. Doudna and others who sort of invented this, it went through a peer review. However, scientists are people too. And when things like, uh, you know, being able to modify genetic code that get, it's, that's hereditary, this is not just yeah. a mutation in your body, this is hereditary. And the, the amount of potential revenues, I mean, think, talk about startups that can come from inventing some tool that'll create say corn that will live in any environment or worse, better, um, is, is tempting for everyone. So they're people too. So to your point, yeah, peer review is important, um, but there have to be other mechanisms as well when you get into areas of like CRISPR-Cas9 and others. So I'm sorry, Ray, you were- No, no, no. I, actually, that's a nice segue into the point I was going to make. I'm putting in a plug for the venture capital industry. It's about 100 billion today, 70% of the capital is in the Silicon Valley, but where's the other 30%? It's actually all over the world. And the National Venture Capital Association has been very a big advocate at, at spawning investments. You need cap, you need scientists, you need industry, you need capital. And in fact, I'm a limited partner in a, in a uh, venture fund in Ramallah, whose mission is to start businesses that bring those two societies together. So one of the things, in fact, here in New York City, Endeavor is a big uh, foundation that that trains venture capitalists to go to Africa, South America. Uh, all the Southeast Asian entities. So it, there, 
what, what, and picking up on the word peace, we're supposed to tie this to peace. There, you know, there's a lot of VC, a lot of young, bright, college-educated scientists, finance people come to the United States. They learn the venture capital business because we did figure it out pretty well, and then they go back home, and that's a very good thing. Good thing. And I'm wondering if, you know, to your bio, you know, one of the great areas, one of the hot areas in uh, tech right now is biomimicry. You know, Mother Nature's figured out this CO2 stuff pretty well. You were saying we need trees, more density, and things like that. So if we apply some of that biomimicry in far off places, we might actually provide jobs, provide an economy, increase the chance of peace, and lower the probability of disruption, and also just create a better world all at the same time. It's a little high and mighty there, but I mean, it's, uh, it's not a crazy point. And I know, I, by name, a lot of people who are out doing that right now. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, there are programs out there on the very positive side, people yeah. looking at coming back to your point of sequestration of carbon, yes. but not pumping it into the ground. Well, but it's letting, scale. Letting nature, yeah. letting nature yeah. metabolize the carbon. Let's help Mother Nature along, speed right. or density. Right. And that's actually a good use of CRISPR, where you can actually modify genes right. and plants. Plants store carbon in their roots, and it's a it, it's a interesting. You can actually store more and more carbon right. in their roots, and it, it sequesters it. So yep. that's a good point. One more good news side on the technology. And that is um, the threat of dirty bombs. It's a miracle we haven't had a radiological weapon. This is not, not a nuclear detonation, but the use of radiological material, conventional explosion, you blow it up, and you may not kill a whole lot of people, but you, den you can deny access if you have the right kind of material, radiological material. You can deny access in a place like a banking district or a port or an airport for years, you can really cause tremendous economic damage. And radiological material is widespread around the world, much of it in commercial use. But the example, for m many hospitals in this country, particularly children's hospitals and large hospitals, I believe in New York City there are 25 or 30 or 35, and Atlanta has uh, several, uh, California, the state of California has many. They have blood irradiators that use uh, cesium-137. Uh, the experts tell me that cesium-137 is the worst form of radiological material in terms of if you explode it, it's dust, so it penetrates brick, it pen penetrates wood, you can't get rid of it. So it just shuts down uh, a whole area, denial of access. Well, it's in hospital blood irradiators all over the country and all over the world. So what can we do about it? Well. Glory be, the, com the commercial sector has come along and they've got x-ray technology now that can replace the very necessary uh, blood irradiators with uh, x-ray technology rather than cesium-137. And it's cheaper. And it's cheaper. Yeah. And the U.S. federal government is really helping get rid of the radiological material, which is the biggest expense of switching over. So right here in New York City, there's been tremendous uh, leadership at the, by the Public Health uh, Department in New York City and they now have commitments to switch over like almost two-thirds um, of all the cesium-137 blood irradiators. So that's an area where technology can, can, can really work. Some countries in Europe are ahead of us. They've already gotten rid of yeah. all of them, but they, I call it pre-positioned equipment for terrorism. So I want to come back to the, the bigger question you started with, uh, Senator Nunn. In your article uh, with Secretary Moniz, just came out, I think it was last month in Foreign Affairs, you had one, one phrase that caught my attention, which was, all that is needed is a spark to light the tinder, which is a very poignant statement. Where should we be looking for that spark? Where do you think that spark may or may not come from? So what is the spark? The spark? Yeah. Well, the, you know, we've used the conclusion of World War I as an example here of a, a war by blunder. Well, if you look at the erosion of arms control, the distrust between the United States and Russia, the largest nuclear powers, uh, the uh, development of technology, which we've already mentioned that may, is making decision time shorter, the confrontation in the Middle East between the United States and Russia, as well as over Ukraine, uh, where military forces are operating in more uh, close quarters, proximate locations near each other than we did even during the Cold War. And then you look at the absence of dialogue, which I, have a, I talked about, uh, and the absence of any kind of uh, sustainable uh, vision of where we're going in terms of the future. And 
what we conclude is the spark could be set off and is waiting to happen. And it doesn't mean that Russia wants a war. I don't think they want a war. I, don't th I know we don't want a war. And certainly I don't think India and Pakistan want a nuclear war. But that's probably the most likely place. But the United States and Russia, nobody knows exactly how to calibrate risk. But whatever the risks were 10 years ago, they are far higher right now. And that's what we mean by uh, a spark that can set, be set off. Uh, just like World War I started yeah. when uh, nobody would have ever predicted how it started, but it did. It started, and all the ingredients were there so that when that spark was lit, there was kindling all over the forest. And what we've got now is kindling all over the forest. So uh, we have a few minutes left, so maybe what we should do is try to tilt a little toward positive, but I'm not sure I can get you there. Let's see if I can get there. Uh, <laughs> So I'm gonna ask a very simple question. We've talked a bit about what we have to be pessimistic about, about sparks and about where, where should we be optimistic? Where, what areas should we be looking at where we should be optimistic in, in this whole is, uh, issue of the relevance of technology and, and, and peace and, and the, the ability to move into a, a peaceful sort of advantageous future for everybody? Do you wanna start, Zumi? <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> Just a little positivism. <laughs> Sure. All right. Okay. Um, as I said, I think historically, um, new innovations have always been uh, primarily, uh, you know, beneficial to humankind. And, and I think we have, I mean, of course, with the, the development of nuclear technologies, so far, um, you know, since 1945, we have actually, you know, kept the non-use principle. We absolutely need to, to maintain that with risk reduction, et cetera, uh, for the arms control um, discussions. I, I think we need to actually believe in our ability if we can actually get past this misperception that dialogue, negotiations, diplomacy, um, are in fact sign of weaknesses, it's actually quite the contrary. Um, it is important for our own security to in fact engage uh, with your perceived adversaries. Uh, if we can actually believe in our own abilities to do that, then I think history has proven so far that we can actually maximize the, the benefits of all the, these technologies and, and minimize the, the dark side uh, of it. Uh, arms control disarmament is an instrument, it's a tool uh, for our security. Um, it's not just a fluffy utopian ideas, but it is a very important instrument. So let's use those instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, let's use the power of diplomacy and dialogue and, and negotiations. Uh, and if we can uh, accept like that. that, I think uh, we, we'll be fine. Accepted. What do you think, uh, optimistically, uh, in terms of nuclear proliferation? Well, let me give you a couple of examples on the uh, optimistic side. Uh, 20 years ago, there were 40 countries in the world that had weapons usable nuclear material. That, didn't, that doesn't mean they had a bomb, but it meant that they had the material, highly enriched uranium or plutonium, that, with which they could produce a weapon. With a tremendous amount of world effort and cooperation uh, under different Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, with great intensity in the Obama administration in particular. We've moved from 40 countries with weapons, usable nuclear material to 22. Now 22 is far too many. Nine countries have nuclear weapons, but 22 have weapons with which um, material, with which nuclear weapons could be made, which means uh, that's the long pole in the tent for a terrorist. If you're a bad guy and you want to make a nuclear weapon, what you have the hardest time uh, achieving is getting the nuclear material. Mm -hmm. So moving that nuclear material to better security is a big deal. We need to keep moving that down, but that's a tremendous accomplishment. We're talking about reducing material in the dirty bomb area. That's a work in progress. Right now, our organization is working with Russia and Central American, I mean Central Asian countries uh, to get rid of a lot of the residual radio radiological material that was there after the Soviet Union. Another example of where cooperation can reduce risk, the fuel bank. It's about to become a reality. It's sponsored by the IEA, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Our organization, with the help of a lot of different people, uh, particularly Warren Buffett, he put up $50 million and asked the world to match it two to one, which the world did after about three years of effort. So we had $150 million to buy enough um, uh, uranium, low enriched uranium, to create a fuel bank in Kazakhstan 
so that countries that might be tempted to go into enrichment of their own indigenous sources to produce peaceful nuclear energy, but the problem with enrichment is the same technology that can produce low enriched uranium that's converted to fuel, three or four percent, um, it is the same technology you make a nuclear weapon with. You just have much higher rich, enriched uranium. So enrichment proliferation itself is a huge danger, and we've had that in the world. But the fuel bank will be a backup to the marketplace. And if a country cannot get fuel from the marketplace, they can go, if they're in good standing with the uh, non-proliferation commitments, they can go and get fuel, pay for it, and then the IEA will replace it. But it's, it's located in a Muslim country in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan gave up their nuclear weapons after the Soviet Union brought, uh, broke up. They were the third or fourth largest nuclear power in the world. They gave them all up, got rid of them. Um, so that's a reality, and it was cooperation. Kuwait made a contribution, UAE made a contribution, the European community made a contribution, the United States made a contribution. The money was raised. The uranium is about to be con concluded in terms of the purchase. And within six months, we will have an operating fuel bank, which has been a dream. We didn't come up with a concept. We helped implement it. But the concept was uh, thought about 40, 50 years ago, and no one has ever done it. Uh, but with cooperation, we can do all sorts of risk reduction. Without cooperation, the future is bleak. So that's why I use the term over and over again, but it happens to be true, is that we're in a race between cooperation and catastrophe. Thank you. Ray? Whew. Okay. Uh, I think on the cyber front, it is all about trust. And again, translating our physical world into the cyber world, it is about trust. And there need to be standards, international standards for the protection of data. The GDPR in Europe is having an impact here, a very positive impact. U.S. companies are already adopting it. California, we have a data. That's just one piece of it. The, the, we need to have conversations. And we need to be, you know, because it is so e digi digital manipulation is so easy. As any, if you haven't seen it, you should see the speech of President Obama gives. It's not him. It's completely manufactured. Mm. You wouldn't think it, you would think it was him. But they show it at Black Hat every year just to remind us what's possible. So we need to be skeptical when we see these things. Again, it's out of the norm. You hear things, you see things. We need to be skeptical in our cyber world as we develop it. And then, you know, I think at the end of the day, we have to teach our children. Just as we learn to clean our fingernails and comb our hair and brush our teeth, we need to do the same thing in cyber. And those standards don't exist. Uh, I've you know been involved in some school things, but it's it, it's early days. We're in this we're in a disruptive phase right now. And then the last thing I will say is you know, and I don't know if this is a Geneva Convention or not because it sort of flies in the face of the business models of collecting data and using it against you. So I don't know how easy that's going to be to solve. But at the end of the day, I'll just say, just remember, please change your password often. It'll help. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> reminder. And since Kate's here, maybe I'll just make one, a few comments about carbon in the sense that uh, fossil fuels are here to stay for quite a while. Yeah. Um, but the good news is that, uh, first of all, we put up a lot of carbon every year and it's growing every year, which isn't great news. But the good news is that we have the technologies today that can displace a great deal of carbon. There's a challenge in, in, in recirculating carbon and in, in refurbishing or, or recycling carbon and that carbon sequestration, which we talk about, still has a long way to go. But other than that, solar, so for example, this country, the U.S., could power, entirely, power itself entirely if we had solar array that was as big as, say, the state of Kansas. Now, it sounds, I hope no one here is from Kansas, but, but it, it sounds bad, but that's really not that much. If you look at a combination of solar, nuclear, the technologies are there. Uh, so that's not the part that's really challenging us. So we could take the 30 gigatons or 35 gigatons of carbon we're producing and displace it in a fairly straightforward way. The challenge in my mind, um, even though science still has to get done and we must invest, so everyone should still invest in science, it's got to be the, the, the policies that drive behavior that are going to be important. And there are difficult carbons, uh, transportation, heavy trucks, airplanes. It's very hard to get rid of those carbons. We all use them. If you came here from the UK, you, it's about a, you produce about a, a ton of carbon per, you know, about 10 tons of carbon per trip across the Pacific, across the Atlantic. But those are all manageable. In the next 50 years, they're manageable. So it's good news, I think, that we can take care of carbon. The challenge will be maybe getting back to the political side is 
how do we really get uh, cooperation and, and the fact that some countries are gonna say, we need to keep doing this. Um, and because in the end, uh, the, the use of carbon in countries today without having all the alternatives is, is, is inextricably tied to GNP. I mean, it's almost linear in GNP. So yeah. you see as China has grown its GNP, they have 1.2 billion people, they're, using, they're producing more carbon than we are today, largely based on GNP. It's just a, it's, there's, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So on the positive side, we have the technology, we just need to figure out how to, how to implement and, and we'll get there. So um, we're, we're almost out of time here. I, I do wanna say that we've ranged, it's a broad ranging group here. We're trying to cover a lot of, a lot of implicit or explicit uh, challenges to, um, to peace but also to, I'd say, even to human survivability beyond, beyond peace. I wanna thank the panelists. I'm sorry, Kate had to go. She, she obviously had a problem, but I wanna thank you all for a really a, a great conversation um, and for engaging in something which is, I, I realize, not all positive. So my hope is that we can all go away from here with this last positive note with some sense that there's hope that, that this, the technology uh, won't save the world without dialogue without policy, without discussion, without really thinking hard about how to implement, how to execute, how to scale. But the technology itself is in itself not bad. It's how it's used. So thank you all for, for staying, for here, being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.